So yeah, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Liz so we can learn about the natural communities of the islands. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eileen. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, everyone, for, um, I apologize. Thank you, everyone, for, for hosting this um, series of events uh, to South Carolina Land Trust and the Northern Library. Um, it's just a wonderful thing that you're doing, and I'm happy to, happy to be part of it. So thank you so much. Um, I am, um, I work with the Vermont Land Trust and we've been, uh, we and the South Hero Land Trust have been great partners over the years, have done many things together. So it's really a delight to, um, to do this thing together as well. And I'm gonna talk about the natural communities of the Champlain Islands, not all of them <laughs> because there isn't time but it's sort of a few highlights and a little bit of background on the geography and, and geology, um, just really in a, in a uh, general way. And then, and then um, a few highlights of natural communities in the islands. Um, you'll see this slide again, this is uh, South Hero, uh, not South Hero, but Alberg uh, Sand Beach in Alberg Dunes State Park. So just as background, a little bit of background, and again, this is, this is not anything new I need to tell you, but you are in, uh, we are in the um, Champlain Valley biophysical region of Vermont, and, and um, there's the Champlain Islands, and a very, very generalized um, story on the geology. This is the most generalized um, geological map that I could find, and it has really three categories of geology. Uh, the dark green on this map is metamorphic rocks. The light green is sedimentary rocks, which is hard to see on that legend. And the purple or pink is, um, is plutonic or igneous rocks. And those are, the, those are also the youngest rocks. So in the Champlain Valley, we're on sedimentary rocks. Now the dark green, the metamorphic rocks, most of those are sedimentary rocks as well, meaning they were laid down as sediments in, in a sea bottom. All, all of these rocks, with the ex exception of the purple and pink ones, were laid down as sediments in a sea bottom. But the difference is with the dark green ones that they have been metamorphosed over time. So we really call those metamorphosed sedimentary rocks or metasedimentary rocks. But here in the Champlain Valley, we, we're sitting on rocks that where the, the, sed the sedimentary nature, the flatness of the rocks is still intact. And as you know, um, also many of the fossils are still intact. And here's another map of, of the geology of Vermont, this one um, showing a, sp a span of time. And what's so interesting about this map is that it shows at the bottom, um, at the bottom of this legend are the, the light gray rocks. Well, the dark gray rocks, which are in the Southern Green Mountains are the, the, um, the very oldest rocks in Vermont. But the next oldest to the Cambrian to Ordovician rocks are the ones here in the Champlain Valley. And so these are extremely old rocks laid down in a shallow sea about 480-ish million years ago. I, I mean, I say ish, because that, you know, at 480 million years, that's a long time. I'd say 481 million, maybe. <laughs> anyway, it's a long time ago. So these are extremely ancient rocks. And another look at that um, that is, comes from Wetland Woodland Wildland, the, natural, uh, the Guide to Natural Communities of Vermont, is a map that we created to show an ecologi ecological classification of Vermont rocks. So that which rocks are, um, which kinds of rocks are, are um, support what kinds of natural communities. And everything on this map that is blue, light blue, or dark blue, uh, is calcareous rock, and these are rocks that are that are um, support that have limestone, calcium somehow in the sediments, and that they support a great diversity of natural communities. Perhaps more so in some ways than the green ones, which are the plutonic rocks or the igneous rocks, and the brown ones, which are the metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. 
Now, here is yet a closer look at the geology of the islands. And I'm not gonna show you what the, what the different, um, different codes are, but you can see these different bands of metamorphic, uh, of rather sedimentary rock. And it is the, this uh, bright pink band that contains many of the fossiliferous rocks in Isle Lamotte and um, the, the Goodsell Ridge uh, quarry and the Fisk quarry, those places where we can, we can go to see really fascinating geological history. Uh, when I started doing this work in Vermont, the place that's now the Goodsell Ridge um, Preserve or, uh, was, was a, just a cow pasture. And you, you know, you had to get permission to go visit the cows and climb over the fence and check out the fossils. And it's just wonderful that it is a place that is more accessible now. Here's a place on Isle Lamont that has um, some of this rock, this sedimentary rock. And in this rock, you can see, um, you can see the wave patterns showing the that this was deposited in the shallow sea. And it's so amazing. And some of these wave patterns are from the original depositional environment. And then these cracks are more recent, um, more recent uh, erosional features. And here is not a great slide, but here's one of the fossils that's found in these fossiliferous limestones. Now, so that's the bedrock geology, a little just very brief history of the bedrock geology. We also have this map of the surficial geology and the surficial geology is what the soils, so soils are made from a, a combination of the bedrock and the, the materials that are laid down on top of the bedrock. And many of those materials have been laid down during glacial and post-glacial times. And so on this map, the gray, uh, the gray is till, is glacial till, and the tan is uh, silts and clays. Dark brown is gravels and sands, and those are, for example, in the in the Lamoille Delta. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of that, and then um, dark red is bedrock exposures, and green is peat and muck. I'm just going to zoom in on this a little bit, and here we are in the islands. And so we can see that a lot of a lot of the surficial deposits in the islands are till, but there are these significant areas of peat and muck. I'll explain that in a little bit. And there are some areas of bedrock exposures, especially look here at the south end of Isle Lamotte, and um, and here in South Hero on the little islands, Providence and Stave, for example. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about natural communities. That's a good thing because my understanding of geology is, is you just about heard everything I know. It's sort of um, basic enough to understand how geology inter interacts with natural communities and plants. But it's, um, so we're gonna talk about natural communities and a natural community is an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment and the natural processes that affect them. That's how we define it. So organisms, and that includes everything. It's not just plants and it's not just animals, but it's all other things. Um, fungi, for example, are organisms, but they're neither plants nor animals, protists, bacteria, everything. And their physical environment, that is the soils uh, underlain by surficial and, and bedrock geology. Um, and also all the natural processes that affect them and we'll be talking about some of those processes. So things like wind, fire, flooding, uh, et cetera. And this is kind of a conceptual representation of what a natural community is in the center. And <clears throat> so we, we think of a natural community as a <clears throat> place that is exhibiting, sort of fully exhibiting its potential. Um, and then it is influenced on the bottom by climate, topography, bedrock, surficial deposits, hydrology. All those five things in turn make the soils what they are. So those are, those are the five, those are, those are some soil forming processes. And then all those things directly and indirectly through the soils that they form influence the natural, influence the natural communities. And things that can change natural communities include natural disturbance, which is part of natural communities. 
um, but it, but it might uh, it might affect the successional stage. Human disturbance, major human disturbance, actually takes a place out of being really what we define as a natural community and turns it into something else, perhaps really great habitat, but not a natural community. With time, um, with time that will, uh, an anthropogenic habitat will return to being a natural community and, um, and also a early successional natural community will return to a later successional stage with time. The amount of time that's required depends upon the nature of the disturbance. And we think of things like impervious surfaces, roads, parking lots, et cetera, things that'll take kind of a long time to get over, but eventually perhaps um, nature would prevail in places like that if, if uh, they are left alone. So I'm gonna just, um, these are just a few, just four places in the islands where that are public lands where you can go to see some of the natural communities that I am gonna be talking about. Um, we have um, North Hero State Park, uh, which has a couple of natural communities that are interesting. Alberg, Alberg Dunes State Park, Night Point State Park, and Round Pond Natural Area in South Hero, or also known as the Land and Farm, or part of, part of it is known as the Land and Farm. Um, North Hero State Park is, a, is one that's especially interesting and fun for me to think about because um, I used to camp there. You know, they used to have campsites there and I and it's just, it, it was always flooded. I mean, it was a place where like, if you went camping there, you'd get, be sure to get wet. Cause I, they, the campsites were in a floodplain forest and it was buggy as all get out. So, um, but it's a great place now to go see some natural communities. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through this um, sort of quick guide to the natural communities of Vermont. And this comes from the book, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, A Guide to the Natural Communities of Vermont. And um, it, it's actually um, on the very last page of the book. And I'm just gonna hold up my copy of the book here. So here's my copy of the book. And if you open the back cover, that, um, that image of this quick guide is um, on the back page and it tells you what page to go to. So it really quick classification of the Vermont natural communities. We have upland communities, we have wetland communities. Within the uplands, we have upland forests and we have open uplands that is non-forested. And then within wetlands, same thing, forests or open. And then within each of those categories, there are three or sometimes four subcategories. So this is a really simplified classification of the Vermont natural communities. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this chart and you'll see with the red boxes where we're going to be at any given time. So we're going to start with upland natural communities, upland forests, and then there's three different forest formations as we call them. The spruce fir forests, the northern hardwood forests, and the oak pine northern hardwood forests. And these are the ones that occur in the warmer climate areas of Vermont, like the Champlain Valley. And we're going to pick just for now just one example of that within that. And that is one of the classic natural communities of the Lake Champlain Islands, of the shores of Lake Champlain. And that is limestone bluff cedar pine forest. Um, this is an illustration by my friend and colleague Libby Davidson, who did most of the illustrations for the for Wetland Woodland Wildland: A Guide to the Natural Communities of Vermont. I love Libby's style. Um, in the in the most recent edition of the book, in the original edition of the book, these were all in black and white, but she hand colored a bunch of these illustrations and. And those are included in the new edition of the book. Um, so you look at this illustration and you might think to yourself, is that for real? <laughs> because, because, you know, do trees like really do that? Do they really twist in, around like that? Is that for real? It's just so, you know, all, almost magical, almost, um, you know, mystical, magical kind of looking. But here's a picture of an actual photograph of one of these limestone bluff cedar pine forests and yeah it's for real this is what they really look like 
these are forests that are extremely rare in Vermont and in the Northeast. You might say, wait a minute, they're everywhere in the islands, everywhere you go. But, um, and they are, but they're very narrow. They occupy a very narrow band on the bluffs of the, uh, of the islands and other places along Lake Champlain. And um, sometimes just only a few feet back from the bluff. So on the bluff, on the cliffs, on the ledges, on the bluff, um, you'll have this, this limestone bluff cedar pine forest, which is dominated by northern white cedar. <clears throat> and here, northern white cedar is really at the southern edge of its range in Vermont. And, um, and, and in the southern edge of its range, in northern white cedar, in the center of its range, further north, occupies a, a, a variety of different kinds of habitats. But here, in the southern portion of its range, it occupies really strict habitats, including um, these very, very shallow to bedrock limestone soils and also wetlands, but not normal, ordinary upland forests. Um, so it's really restricted to just very dry and very wet places, oddly enough. But look at this beautiful photo, which I think was taken by Eric Sorensen, my colleague, and, and just the, the beautiful mossy ground and also this down cedar, which is rotting and has lichens and mosses on it and is slowly rotting and, and putting more nutrients um, on the forest floor. These trees can be much older than you might think. Um, they can be very old. And here's another photo of a limestone bluff cedar pine forest. And here's a cedar, a northern white cedar, just clinging. Look at that bedrock. So that is, you can see that some of the, some of the um, sedimentary rock, flat plates of limestone, and the northern white cedar roots just clinging, clinging, clinging to it and growing very slowly. This is a place in Isle Lamotte, uh, the south end of Isle Lamotte where there's a beautiful example of this natural community and my colleague Bob Zeno walking through it. And there is another, you know, another down log with some moss on it and a little northern white cedar seedling just getting started in that moss. And it is the moss on that log that's providing the seed bed for that seed to, to be able to, to um, germinate and grow and become a new northern white cedar. And here is, this is, um, this is again, the, the same area that I was showing you before, but here's some of that bedrock with the deep fissures carved into it. And there's Bob Zeno again, um, coring a tree, coring a northern white cedar in that forest last summer. Um, some of the interesting things that grow here, this is called walking fern, which is really characteristic of these rocky areas, rocky limestone areas. And a, um, this is a, a species of sanicle or um, snake root. And I'm showing you this partly because it's a rare plant that occurs in this natural community, um, Sanicula trifoliata or three-leaved um, sanicle. And look at those fruits is what they are, those um, spiny things. And that's my pant leg as I was walking through this forest. They stuck to me along with some other things. And, these are um, sweet Sicily seeds, and these are the sanical seeds. So I took some of these home inadvertently. Um, but look at this. This is actually, just to show you, this is a, a, one of the a stump that was cut in that forest, uh, not by us, but, but had been cut previously. And you can see the growth rings are pretty wide at the very beginning. But look how skinny they get. Look how narrow they get as the tree grows. And they get to the point out out here as the tree grows that um, it's actually even hard to, to count these growth rings. Northern white cedars on these kinds of cliffs um, have been, this natural community occurs um, throughout, um, in, throughout the Northeast, but as I say, very rarely in a very limited distribution on the Niagara Escarpment. Um, trees up to a thousand years old, uh, Northern white cedars have been found and there's one tree that um, was dead when it was count when the rings were counted, but but by the time it died, it was about 1,650 years old. So um, so they can get um, get to be very very old, but not very big. So these are kind of like what we call like old growth forests in plain sight, and um, 
it's just a, a fascinating phenomenon and it's reasonably common in the islands. Uh, this is one of the things that affects this natural community, ice loading in the winter. Um, that, that is just, it's one of the natural ecological processes and these trees are amazing at withstanding this. Other trees cannot and that's why the northern white cedars actually do well but other trees don't. Another interesting plant um, that grows on these, in these natural communities, maidenhair spleenwort. And then one of my favorites, which is this thing called ebony sedge. And I put this picture in here partly because just as an example, one of the illustrations um, by my colleague and friend, Betsy Brigham, that is in the, um, in the book, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, beautiful illustrations. But this sedge, ebony sedge is really almost restricted to this natural community in Vermont. It really needs shallow to bedrock limestone soils and grows right with the Northern white cedar. Okay, well, that's that. And now let's go to, um, meant to put the box down under uplands, but let's go to upland shores. And we're gonna look at a couple of different things, a couple of different kinds of beaches that occur in the islands. One of the common ones is Lake Shale or Cobble Beach. Um, so some of the, back going back to the geology, and I won't go back to that slide, but, but some of the, um, the bedrock in the islands is really, is what's called Iberville shale. So it's really a shaley rock that breaks down easily into shale pieces and, and flat, flat stones. And this forms a lot of the beaches on uh, Lake Champlain in the islands in particular. This is a very common type of situation in the islands that you all are familiar with, I know. Um, and these are great places to go if you wanna skip some stones because the, the, the shale stones are flat. These are great places for turtles to bask and lots of other interesting things. And here's another picture of that natural community. Um, sometimes a berm, you know, a real berm can form with a wetland behind it. And this natural community, this is not from Round Pond, but this natural community, this, this uh, shale beach is found um, at, at Round Pond. Um, and so you can, you can see this natural community there well represented. And there is, as you know, a wetland behind that and other wetlands associated with it. Some of the plants that occur um, on these shale beaches, uh, Canada anemone is one. Um, be, before I move on, I wanna make sure I re recognize that some of these photos that were provided for this, this is sort of a crowdsourced slideshow. <clears throat> this slide is from my colleague, Everett Marshall. He provided a number of the slides for this show, as did my other colleagues, Bob Zeno, Matt Peters, Eric Sorensen, and, and um, those are the four main people who provided <clears throat> slides, but um, I'll try to recognize them as we go along. But another thing in this slide, look at this, this, this little yellow thing, which isn't the, necessarily the purpose of this slide, but this is, um, this is called silvery, uh, silver weed or silvery, silver, yeah, silver weed. It's a kind of sink foil and it grows on these cobble shores as well. And marsh, swamp milkweed is another one that grows in these places, lovely thing. Um, hedge nettle, a member of the mint family that grows in these places. So they're really great diverse places, great places to find wildflowers, particularly late in the year. Now Lake Sand Beach, and this is back to that original um, photo at the beginning. Again, this is uh, South Alberg. And this is actually looking at the beach from the east side, um, from the very far east side. And this is not the way you approach it by car. Um, there, you can get to it by car from, from this side, but generally speaking, people come to it from the other side, which is where the parking is. But as you can see in this photo, um, although I'm calling this a, a lake sand beach, there's also this cobble beach in the foreground. So both kinds of beaches are present at South Alberg, um, just really side by side. And here's looking at it from the other end. This is looking at it from the, um, from the western end, the more um, visited, the more used end. Now here is another, this is an aerial photo that was taken 30 years ago or something quite, quite a long time ago, but um, so it's not of the highest quality, but this is another beach. And this is a beach that is in South Hero on private property. 
And when I discovered this beach in the course of doing some inventory work in the islands in 1991 or 92, I was so excited to find it because it's a beach that is of the same quality and of the same magnitude as the South Albert Beach, but hadn't really been known or described before we did this inventory work. And one of the things that is beautiful about this beach is that in spite of the fact that there are houses, which you can see all along um, the upper reaches of the beach, um, private camps um, and homes, the natural vegetation of the beach is still there um, in, all of this, in all of its glory, really. You can see these strand lines where, where different levels, lake levels have, have brought in seeds, dropped those seeds, and those seeds have been allowed to, to grow and, and the natural vegetation of the beach is there. There is some grooming that takes place, but actually not anywhere near as much as takes place at the public South Albert Beach. Um, here's another view of that beach, again, an old and you know, fuzzy photo, but you can see that sometimes there's quite a lot of water on the beach. And here a couple, again, an old photo, but a couple of my colleagues on the right, that's Everett Marshall, who I just mentioned, and on the left, Ken Metzler. Um, who's an ecologist from Connecticut, and when and we did some inventory work on this beach um, at, at this again, this is about 30 years ago. So just it was really fun to discover and fun to do a little more work there. Some of the things that grow on the beach, cockleburr, you're probably familiar with this. It looks a lot like burdock, but it is not burdock. It's a slightly different thing. And it has separate male and female flowers. Here's the male flowers and he's, here's the female flowers. Inside that burr, there are just two, that is just two flowers, of uh, uh, female flowers. And um, here's a closer look at it. And then here is a closer look at the male um, flowers. You can see the stamens there. This is just a, this a really close view of that. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And again, you know, like burdock and like that thing that was sticking to my pants leg in the previous um, slides, the, these, um, these things are designed to get around. These are, these are designed, um, these fruits are designed to be moved by animals um, when they are in maturity. Um, I wish we were in person because I'd say, okay, here's a quiz. What's this? <laughs> Poison ivy. And this grows commonly on the beaches as well. This is a really cool one. Look at this picture. This is a, a plant called clammy weed. And um, it's actually in the caper family, the same family as capers, you know, that you, that you use in, in uh, culinary um, work and uh, this, but it's called clammy weed because as you can see the fruits of this thing, these pods are very um, sticky and that's their way of getting around. The flowers are in the center and as they mature into these pods, the sticky pods are ready to stick to things. And here's a slightly closer look at the clammy weed. But also look at this picture. The other thing that's in this picture is this little thing here, a little flat sedge. And this here is a cottonwood seedling. If you look closely at these beaches, there's just all kinds of stuff, all kinds of interesting stuff. You think of a beach as bare and barren and there's nothing there, but no, there's all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of plants to enjoy and study. And this one is one called Starry False Solomon Seal that grows on the beaches, really fun little plant. And this is one called um, Ond flat sedge. This is one of the many species of flat sedge. This thing is like an inch and a half tall. I mean, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. And here's two more species of flat sedge. This is again, my friend Everett Marshall for holding these two species. These are actually two different species of flat sedge. Um, and they're both like three inches tall. What One is common and one is rare. Um, they look very similar, but they're actually different species. So just all kinds of fun little things and a lot of rare plants that grow on these beaches. And here's, here's a couple of the rare plants. Again, a sort of fuzzy photo, but let's take a closer look. And this is called Wright's Bulrush. Um, this plant is a very rare plant. It's, it's globally rare, but it's actually not that uncommon in Vermont. And a few years back when we had a lot of low water, when we had a low water year and, and late in the fall, we had um, a lot of beaches exposed. We, we found lots of, um, we, not, not me, but um, our colleagues found a lot of um, examples. And Aaron Marcus took this photo. Aaron is a person who I also need to acknowledge for their work on, um, on this. Closer look, this is also probably Aaron's photo of Wright's flat sedge, a rare species on these beaches, and it grows in South Alberg. 
Um, here's another one that's less rare, but water star grass. It grows right on the beaches. And here's one that um, is in the mustard family. This is a very rare plant, but it, um, but it does grow uh, sometimes on these beaches. Now, we, I, it was advertised that I would talk about soils, and I've talked a little bit about geology and so forth. Well, OK, here's some people digging, some students in, at the University of Vermont in my botany class. And you can see that this is during COVID time, but we were, um, so people were masked up, up this first year of COVID. And uh, we were digging a soil pit um, at the South Alberg beach. And you might think, OK, well, it's sand, so what? Big deal. Um, but when we looked deeper under that sand, we found this dark, dark brown stuff. And I'm just going to leave that mystery, let that mystery sit for a minute. And go on to the natural community that is adjacent to the sand beach, and that is the sand dune, an extremely rare natural community of which we have only a couple examples in Vermont. Um, and on the sand dune, um, and this is a picture actually of the South Alberg sand dune, and this is a picture that was taken last fall, where you can see that the wind is blowing the sand. The lake is off in the distance. You can't see it in this picture, but, but you can see that the wind is blowing the sand, actively blowing the sand away from the beach toward, and I'm, as I say, I'm looking out toward the water. Um, so the, the sand is actively being moved around all the time. And this is what keeps sand dunes functional. And there's a bunch of plants that grow on the sand dunes that thrive on that disturbance. Here's my colleague, Bob Pop, who is um, making notes on this sand dune at Alberg um, last year. And this is a plant called Champlain beach grass, which grows um, on Lake Champlain in only a few locations. It's related to the coastal beach grass, but it is one that has a species that has evolved separately over the time since the Champlain Sea occupied the Champlain Basin. And it is considered um, a, a subspecies of that coastal beach grass now. But it's an extremely rare thing. It flowers at a different time. Its stature is different. Um, but like the coastal beach grass, it grows on dunes and thrives in, in the disturbance and actually helps to stabilize the dunes to some extent. And there it is again in a closer look. Now, one thing that's really interesting about this grass is that even though it produces these flowering stalks, um, the things that you see here, those are actually not seeds, those are fungi. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of ergot, but um, it's, a, it's a fungus that grows in, <clears throat> on grasses and um, can be <clears throat> certain, certain um, kinds of ergot can be um, deadly poisonous, so I wouldn't, wouldn't uh, go eating it. But, but anyway, the, there are actually are no seeds. There there's, are, are all these fruiting heads, but there are no actual seeds in here. Um, so that the, the beach grass actually doesn't reproduce by seed. It reproduces only vegetatively by spreading by rhizomes. Once in a while, it'll produce a seed, but just very rarely. Another one of the coastal relics, as we call them, that occurs in these dunes is um, beach pea. And beach pea is another one that is common on the coast, um, but quite rare here in Lake Champlain. Um, and it, it, it came in when the Champlain Sea invaded the Champlain Basin. Another rare plant, um, but not, not one of the coastal disjuncts. This one is a um, beach wormwood. And there are the fruits of wormwood. It is um, related to, to the common mugwort. So that is, those are the, those are the beaches. Um, now let's look at a couple of forested wetlands and particularly lakeside floodplain forest, which is a floodplain forest that occurs on the shores of Lake Champlain or adjacent to the shores of Lake Champlain. And it's really an uncommon natural community in Vermont. These places are flooded every year. And as to how they differ from river floodplain forests is that the flooding duration is longer. So the water sits longer in the lake and so that, um, so that the flooding duration is Whereas a river, a riverside floodplain forest might flood just for a few hours, a lakeside floodplain forest will remain flooded for days. 
And so that creates some different conditions um, in different sets of species. And so here you can, again, you can see the flooding in the lakeside floodplain forest. And this is actually a photo um, that shows the, the evidence of that flooding. So in this photo, you can see the silt line on this tree, um, and this is a silver maple tree. And you can see that the, the floodwaters have sat there for quite some time, leaving, leaving the, um, the scar of the flooding. And then up above, there's another scar that might be um, a shorter of duration flooding event, um, but there may have been ice involved in that, which causes sort of dent in the tree. And here's another thing that occurs in these floodplain forests as a result of the inundation, the saturation is the trees, tree bases tend to, to flare out like this or like this. This is a winter view of one of these floodplain forests and a couple of things about this picture. Um, well, there's three things to note. One is the, the tree over on the left is an ash tree. The tree over on the right appears to have been cut by, um, chewed by beaver. And then in the center, these stalks here are stalks of sensitive fern. And here's a photo of one of these floodplain forests in the summer. Um, but going back to that one, the leftover fruiting, um, not the spore bearing leaves of the, of the sensitive fern are showing there in the winter view but there's a summer view of sensitive fern. Now going back to the ash, here is a, a picture of the, of the ash tree in these floodplain forests. And that um, person on the right is Nancy Patch, who is your county forester. Um, and she was, she were, we were visiting this forest last summer and admiring all the ash trees. And one of the things about green ash, um, Green ash and white ash are two, I'm not going to go into the, you know, the comparison of them because we don't have time, but, but the bark of these two species is very similar. It's this sort of corduroy bark uh, that's very similar. But if you look closely at the leaves of green ash, you'll see that often the leaves of green ash are fuzzy underneath. That's one of the things that distinguishes green ash from white ash. And the the fruits of green ash have this very long, long, skinny um, seed portion on the inside compared to white ash. So they're they're different, you know, they're different species. Interestingly, this you'll see that there are actual cedar leaves in this photo as well, mixed in with the, with the ash. Some of the interesting spe other interesting species that occur in lakeside floodplain forests. This is a rare sedge called Gray's sedge. Another rare sedge called cattail sedge. And um, there's other things as well, but let's quickly look at um, a couple of swamp types. And this is a maple green ash swamp. So again, green ash comes into play um, in these wetlands. They're really, really common in the islands. I mean, a lot of the wetlands in the forested wetlands in the islands are this natural community type. We used to call this natural community type red or silver maple green ash swamp because those, but what we, why we just simply call it maple green ash swamp now is because red and silver maple, they're both present. Um, both, both of those species of maple are present in these swamps, but also present is a hybrid between them called Freeman's maple, which is really common in the islands, but really not any place else. And it's common where the two species co-occur, which is which happens in the islands. So we've got red maple, silver maple, and Freeman's maple, and sort of everything in between occurring in the in these swamps in the islands. The fascinating place where all this this mixing, this hybridization takes place. And so this is a, a sort of uh, this is a summer view of one of these swamps. They're kind of complicated places, often with a slightly open canopy like you see here, not super closed canopy. Um, and there's a little <laughs> video, I don't know if that's actually working, of the, um, the interior of one of these swamps. And if you can hear a voice in the background, that is Everett Marshall, just so I'm showing what this looks like. I'm gonna move on. And this is a plant called um, tufted loose strife that um, occurs commonly in these swamps. 
Another rare plant that occurs in these swamps is this thing called false hop sedge. Another kind of swamp that occurs in the islands, and this is actually a rare swamp type, is red maple white pine huckleberry swamp. And this is common actually in South Alberg, and huckleberry is a common species that occurs in these swamps. Now softwood swamps, I can't do this without talking about the black spruce swamp at South Alberg, which is a beautiful, beautiful swamp. Um, you look up into the canopy of the, the black spruce trees and you see these pom-poms um, of black spruce. Now black spruce is a really northern species. So the fact that it occurs here in the islands is just, um, is just fascinating. And, um, but it's a beautiful place. And as Route 129 crosses right through the South Alberg Swamp, um, that's a great place to just slow down and look into the woods and see this amazing black spruce swamp. And in, if you go into that swamp, you'll see and look very, very closely at the black spruce trees and twigs, you'll see this weird, weird thing, which is, um, and here's a close up of it, which is called dwarf mistletoe. And this is a parasitic plant. Uh, yep, related to the mistletoe of, you know, the holly and mistletoe, mistletoe and all that stuff. Um, related to that, but this is a very, very tiny inconspicuous plant that's rare in Vermont, um, rare in the Northeast. Um, a parasitic plant that changes, um, changes the way that the, that the branches grow, but doesn't kill the tree. Another thing that grows in these swamps is uh, winterberry holly, one of my favorites. Um, and this is, this is a plant that grows in the swamps, and this is called three-leaved fall Solomon seal, related to that starry fall Solomon seal that grows on the beach. And um, here's a, a, maybe a better view or a better sense of what the swamp looks like in the interior with tawny cotton grass a common, common species. And the other common species here are shrubs, mostly in the heath family. So there's, here's the cotton grass close up, but here's a, here's, here's a view of high bush blueberry late in the season when the blueberries are all withered up. But that's one of the common species in this swamp, along with huckleberry, which you saw before, and Labrador tea and, and bog rosemary, bog laurel, things like that. And finally, um, some marshes, and this is just an aerial view of the Mississippi Delta, just to give you a sense of the variety of marshes. Um, this is obviously not in the islands, but nearby. Deep bulrush marsh is one that you'll see um, commonly around the fringes of the islands. And here is um, um, burr reed, common burr reed, as a plant that grows in those, in those marshes, and there's its fruits. Um, a couple of different kinds of bulrush. Here's one called river bulrush, slender bulrush. And then here's another kind of natural community that's common in these, in the, uh, along the fringes, deep broadleaf marsh. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a, an, again, really common. Usually these are, the word deep is, is descriptive, meaning that the water is two, three, four, sometimes four feet deep. But again, in a low water year, these will actually yield during a drawdown cycle. Um, some of these plants will actually be stranded on the land. And um, so you can get, get up closer to them. But among these things is water smartweed, a beautiful, beautiful plant in the buckwheat family. Um, and then our um, uh, water lily, white water lily and pickerel weed and a, a type of, this is a type of, um, of Rumex. And there is a great blue heron sitting, <laughs> sitting in a, on um, the lily pads in a deep um, broadleaf marsh. Lakeshore grassland is a rare natural community that occurs at Night Point State Park. That's a great place to go and see it. Again, this is a very old photo, but from there, um, some of the plants that occur there, uh, Baney Meadow Rue, Ontario Aster, these are both very rare plants. This is a common plant, nodding burr, marigold, cardinal flower, blue burr vein. Those are some great things to see. And finally, buttonbush swamps are a common thing in the islands. And here's a winter view 
of a button bush swamp. And you can see the little buttons on the button bushes. And there's button bush itself um, flowering in the summer. Member of the coffee family. So that's it for my little quickie tour of the natural communities of the Champlain Islands. But here again, um, just for review, is uh, a map of those places where you can go, public lands where you can go to find these things. There are lots of private lands where you can also go to find some of these things. But these are, these are good places on public property where you can go to find some of these things. So Albert Dunes State Park, um, which it's just wonderful that it's protected and available and um, open to the public. It's been a protection project, a co cooperative. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has helped a lot with that project over the years. Um, so the Nature Conservancy um, and the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, many different natural communities there. North Hero State Park, Lakeside Floodplain Forest, Maple Green Ash Swamp, probably Buttonbush Swamp as well. Knight Point State Park, Lakeshore Grassland, a great thing to see there. Um, just walk around, you know, away from the grassy area and you'll see it. And uh, Round Pond Natural Area, um, several different natural communities that you can see there. Um, finally, this is, I just want to say thank you to, um, to South Hero Land Trust and, and uh, South Hero Worth and Library uh, for posting this series of events and welcoming me here. It's, um, it's just great that you're doing this. And this is just a screenshot from your, from your website of the upcoming events. And I'm sure that the two of you, Eileen and Guy, perhaps will want to talk a little more about that. And um, we'll leave some time for, for some questions. Liz, thank you so much for that presentation. That was really fascinating. I um, I'm going to check out some more of those spots now. Um, I'll open up the Q&A and Liz, are you able to see that Q&A here? No, but let me see if I can. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to look at them and answer them or do you want to call them out? How do you want to do this? Um, I suppose you can just uh, go go through them and select which ones you would like to answer live. Okay. Okay. So um, so far, I, I only see two questions in there. So the first one is: Why does Champlain beach grass have fruiting structures but no seeds? What evolutionary function does that serve? Well, so seeds, fruits, and seeds are expensive to produce. So it, it costs a lot of energy for a plant to produce seeds. And that is one way of getting around, of, of dispersing yourself, um, is, is to disperse by seed. And so, so they do some of that, but they, but they, and it's hard to describe this without sort of anthropomorphizing, you know, without sort of making it, making, giving them agents, giving the plant agency or intention in the same way that we have it. But, but over time, it has been, found to be successful that that in the habitat within the habitat that they occupy moving around spreading around by rhizomes is a really um, effective way of getting around locally it's not an effective way of moving from large distances but short distances yes it is um, it's an effective way to get around so why produce seed why spend the energy to produce seeds and fruits when you're getting around perfectly fine in another way it doesn't work for all plants, but for Champlain beach grass, it does, it does serve well. How can you get the book uh, is the second question I see. And I would say that, um, you know, the book is, is, is sold, uh, Wetland, Woodland, Wildland, that is perhaps what you're referring to. And if so, um, that is sold in local bookstores, but also um, I would go directly to Chelsea Green, Chelsea Green Publishing, which is um, the distributor of the book. Um, is a good place to get it from. You know, you can also go to the online booksellers, of course, but um, but that would be a good place. But I'd love to see you support going to Phoenix Books or something and and uh, see if you can get it there. Charlie Tipper, Charles Tipper says, please tell us about the purple dots, igneous rocks on the lakeshore in the first geology slide. Okay, 
whoa, that was really great, <laughs> great observation. Um, those are actually not igneous rocks. Those are little, um, those are, uh, that's another indication on that geology map um, of, of not, not igneous rocks, but other formations. And I'd have to go back to it, Charlie, and, and um, look, but those are not actually igneous rocks, but, but other things in that, in that map. I'll have to go back to it and get back to you. Dave Capen says, are there some obvious sites for further conservation in the islands? Oh boy, I put that back to you. How about Guy? How about, do you wanna talk about that? That is a great question that I do not have an answer for. <laughs> but I think that, you know, using natural communities has, using the lens of looking at natural communities has helped with conservation efforts. and I. You know, this is before my time, but I, I believe that one of the reasons that Brown Pond was conserved was because of the diversity and the uniqueness of the natural communities um, at Round Pond. Uh, so that really made it a high priority for conservation. And so it's definitely a factor when looking at conservation, um, like where are some of those rare natural communities? Um, I, I don't know of any like off, off the top of my head where there's sites, um, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, definitely, it's definitely helpful though in identifying you know, where you can conserve places though. Yes, a couple of the places that I talked about here, um, didn't want to be too specific, but places that are private land presently um, that could potentially benefit from further conservation. Again, you know, don't want to point out particular landowners, but, but there's a lot of, um, you know, there are some opportunities there. And then there's a question from Viva, um, and also um, someone else had asked this in the chat. Um, are the ash trees you discussed su susceptible to the ash borer? Um, oops, I missed another one from Charlie, and I'll get back to that. But yes, both species are susceptible to the emerald ash borer. Um, and you have emerald ash borer in the islands. Um, it's right there in South Hero. Um, which, um, and Guy, did you want to say something about that? Uh, it looks like maybe you had put in a, an answer to that question. Oh, no, I was just marking some of the answers when they were answered. I was just okay. putting in that yeah. they had been answered, but um, I can put a link in the chat to more information about Emerald Ash Borer in the islands and uh, a contact for Nancy Patch, who's a great person to connect with if you have more questions locally. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, but they both are susceptible. There's also black ash in the islands. There's these three species of ash in Vermont, and they're all susceptible. Um, black ash a little bit more um, than the others, perhaps. Um, and that is the one that is used in basket making. Um, so it's it's a tragic thing, but yes. And then for, from Charlie Tipper again, how, do, do we differentiate between northern white cedar and eastern white cedar? Yeah. and and um, uh, Eastern white cedar is actually just another name for Northern white cedar. Um, but then there's Eastern red cedar, which is a juniper, which is a completely different thing. But uh, Northern white cedar is sometimes called Eastern white cedar. That's Thuya occidentalis. And then um, the juniperus um, virginiana, the Eastern red cedar. Um, so those two things do grow together on these bluffs, um, but the red cedar is one that grows that is more common in the islands as an old field tree. You know, I have a friend who lives in the islands who brings one in every year from an adjacent old field as a Christmas tree. And um, so, so yeah, there are, there's just one species of, of, of Thuya, Thuya occidentalis, and then this one species of eastern red cedar, Juniperus virginiana, confusing. Thanks for that. The purple spots are igneous rocks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, somebody who knows. Can you, uh, yeah, maybe maybe in the chat, Stephen, you can say more about that. Um, I apologize for my, as I, I, I owned at the beginning, I'm not a geologist, so I really, so they're little dikes. They're Cretaceous aged igneous dikes. Um, which are intrusions, but very small intrusions in comparison with the large intrusions that we see in the northeastern part of the state, which are big, what we call plutons. These dikes are smaller intrusions into the sedimentary rock. So thanks a lot for that. 
could beech wormwood be used to make absinthe? And that I do not know. I don't know about it's about that. Does the book go more specifically into the various plants you mentioned in the different areas? The book has lists of uh, of plants that you can find in each of the natural communities. So for each natural community, there's a there's a list of things you can find there, and a list of the common plants and a list of the rare plants. And so it does go into more specifics about which plants you can find. It doesn't go into the biology of those plants so much. That's not what the book is about, but, um, but it does talk about more about which plants you can find where. Um, Liz, I actually had a question for you about your presentation. Um, do you have any theories as to why black spruce occurs this far south? Um, at the black spruce swamp, because you mentioned that it is normally a, a more further north species. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it, it reminds me of something else that I meant to get back to, which was the soil that's under the sand beach. And that, that was is, another thing I wanted that, to know. <laughs> that is the peat soil. So that swamp and the beach are adjacent to one another, right? And the beach has actually moved over time has moved up and over the wetland soils up and over the swamp and so in the swamp um the, and that's why there's sand on top of peat there it's fascinating and the peat there is 16 to 18 feet deep it, that's how deep the peat deposit is it's a it's sphagnum peat and woody peat and that peat actually holds holds the cold for a very long time in the spring. It's an insulator. The peat is an insulator. And so it keeps it, it, it keeps it cold for a long time in the spring. So it's an unusual, it's a microclimate basically. It's a cold microclimate where that black spruce can occur and, and grow. Uh, yes, there is there the question, there's a question, is there an, any invasive exotic purple loose stripe in the islands? Yes, lots of it. <laughs> Um, ash tree follow-up question. Is there any standard conservationists standard that conservationists are using for dealing with the ash borer infest infestation management, either preventive or once an infestation is discovered? There are, I would go to your county forester, Nancy Patch, again. I would go to the Vermont Forest Parks and Re Recreation website. The really, really short answer to that is be careful, do not just proactively get rid of all your ash trees. That's that's the one message that managers are, are trying to get out there is do not get rid of all the ash trees before the emerald ash borer shows up. What we're trying to do is leaves, there are some trees that are resistant out there. We don't know where they are, what they are, but we're trying to um, give them an opportunity to survive and produce seeds. So don't cut everything down. Um, the management includes removing trees where they're a hazard, you know, um, in cities and towns, um, but but not just in your woods. Keep an eye on them, make notes. We actually have a protocol where we're gathering data and we can share that information with you. But I, I'd really get in touch with your county forester, Nancy Patch, for more more uh, guidance on that. And yeah, I just put, um, her... put that in the uh, guy just put that in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, I just put her email in the chat, and um, as well as I would visit, uh, I think if, but if you scroll up a little bit, uh, vtinvasive.org has a lot of really great resources. If you have ash trees on your land, uh, if you want to learn how to identify ash trees, they have tons of great resources there, so you can learn more about ash trees. Um, and um, yeah, and um, one of the things that um, South Carolina Land Trust and Vermont Land Trust are actually coordinating on is um, some long-term ash monitorment, uh, long-term ash monitoring plots, and something that Alaire Diamond from from Vermont Land Trust got us um, connected with, where we're we are studying um, ash plots um, and seeing where there might be lingering ash. So you know that one percent or whatever of ash they're going to be resistant to the ash borer. We we want to be able to find those because those ones are going to be really crucial for um, saving seeds and, and from saving cuttings from, um, because those genetics, whatever it is, whether it's mechanical or chemical, somehow some ash are gonna be able to still survive the ash borer. And so we, we, we want to be able to use those um, to help repopulate once, once the ash borer comes, comes through. And we actually will have some uh, volunteer opportunities for that coming up. So if anyone's curious, you can um, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, so, you know, you, Go to our website, sign up for our, e our email list is probably the best way. Excellent. 
great. Where do cottonwood trees live? Well, a lot of the a lot of the beaches do have cottonwood trees. So I showed you that one picture of cottonwood seedlings on the beach, and that's a and also in the floodplain forest. So those are the two places: beaches, shores, floodplain forest. And that might be that might be it for questions. Yeah, that's pretty well timed because um, that's about all the time that we have this afternoon anyway. So um, thank you all for coming to watch this presentation, and thank you so much uh, to you, Liz, for sharing all your knowledge about the islands. I know I learned a lot. Um, I'll be sending follow-up emails to all the participants for feedback and for, um, and I'll, I'll be sharing the slides that Liz was sharing today as well. So, um, and if you'd like to learn more about our upcoming Winter Wednesday events, please check out our, our the South Hero Land Trust um, events page, which is in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Enjoy the rest of your days. <laughs>